Four o'clock on the dot, like a machine. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Rapid Fire Golf, episode 33, back outside at the beautiful Bethlehem National Driving Range. <laughs> nice Monday, back from a little vacation. For Mary and I, I'm going to pull my stuff over. Um, hope everyone is doing well, had a good weekend, ready to rock and roll. As always, for those of you that have been here before, post your questions up. I will uh, answer them to the best of my ability. And for those that are new, rapid fire, you ask questions, I'll answer them uh, as quickly as I kind of can, and we'll rock and roll. Uh, so whenever you're ready, post them up and we'll get going. I'm going to bring my stuff over here and see if I'm pretty neutral here. How are we looking? That looks pretty good. Should I do one more for the, for the crowd? Open, passive. That look good, Mayor? Yeah. Open, passive. Oh. Open, passive. How'd that look? Feels good. I'm going to do one more. I felt so good. I need another one. Open, passive. Got my George lower body and my Marty release pattern. It's about as good as I can do right there. Does that look as good as it feels? Or does it just feel good and not look good? Okay. Bob, hey guys, my driver's working better as path is more from the inside. However, it is now a push fade. Da -da 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 -da. Not sure if it is ball position, lack of rotation, or perhaps in the hands arms, thanks. Um, if your path is now more from the inside and you're push fading, so start right, curve right, you want to, assume you want to keep a draw, you want to keep that path working inside out, but you have to figure out how to get the face to path working different. What's happening now, if that's true, assuming you're correct, your path is right, but your face is still open. So now it starts right, curves right. If you want to hit the draw, you want to keep the path to the right, but you have to figure out how to close the face. What you normally would see, let's say if you're someone who hit a fade normally, normally what happens is your club face gets open. As a result of that, you swing outside and across and you hit that little kind of fade pattern. Now, if you just change the path first without changing the face, you still got that open club face. Now you're swinging to the inside, your path's better, but the face is still open, so you hit push cut. So in a general sense, what I would say there is, you need to um, square the face. The question is how, I can be grip, wrist conditions, form, rotation, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Bob, if I could see what that looked like or see why that is, um, that would be the, the deal if the push guy, you gotta fix the face some way, shape or form. Thanks again for the insight. Drills for keeping left arm straight, stopping chicken wing. So Homer, it really depends on why that's happening. Um, if you're talking about in the follow through in particular, where you get narrow, we've got some cool videos coming out in the next couple of weeks with Marty Nowicki. Um, he's a pro down at uh, Turning Stone. He owns the Impact Snap. And we did a bunch of videos on the follow through um, patterns. You guys will see that. Some sort of stock drill stuff you can do for that is like a tour striker ball between your arms, right? To kind of learn how to build some structure and start really short with some little tiny ones. Keep the distance between your elbows close. Hit some shots and squeeze your elbows close together. Like, see how close my elbows are? This would be a chicken wing, arms really far apart. Here's my elbows really tight together and that gets that really far away from me. Now really, you gotta find if there's something going on earlier that's causing that. Is your club face too open and you're doing that to square it? Are you too steep and you're doing that to shallow it and fix whatever's going on earlier? Um, but that would be something you can do with, if you search my name in chicken wing, I talk about the need for lead arm supination, which is really grip dependent. Um, but that's another one you can check for that, Homer. Uh, love your squat and turn video, could you review? Yeah, so kind of the, the, I mean, we've done a bunch of different videos about during the downswing. The premise of it is, um, when you watch good ball strikers and you draw a line on their head, they get lower to the ground during the downswing. Now, why does that happen? A couple of reasons. Part of it is because the legs are reflexing or squatting, right? If I took a normal, even just stood here, my legs are bent a certain amount. If I bend them more, my head goes where? Down or up? It goes down, right? So if I go up to the top, whatever amount of knee bend I have, and I increase the amount of knee bend I have, I will lower. Now, that act of Increasing my knee bend and lowering really does two things. One, um, if I do that and I keep some external rotation in it, it helps me uh, rotate and it also allows me to use the ground, right? So I can start to shift some pressure forward without shifting a ton of mass and then be able to push out of that ground for more speed on the way through. So it's really optimal. It's not the only way to do it, but if you wanted to max out contact speed, club face control, you would reflex a la like a Rory and then, um, and then learn how to turn with it. So that would be that would be sort of ideal, and there's just no 
denying the rotation, better ball strikers, if you actually measure them, are open, right? They, they're, they're rotated a bunch. Of course, there's good ball strikers who don't rotate as much, but um, rotation in the lowering part and some of the videos we've done about why the pros are so consistently good. And um, I think that's the video we did where we kind of track the belt line and they were like lowering all the way through. I think it's why the pros are so consistently good or something like that. Um, was that Brett? Thank you for all the tips and uh, thank you for all the tips. You're welcome. Any drills for working on P6 to finish? Yeah, Brett, it really depends on which part you're working on there. Um, P6 would be sort of a delivery position here where the club's last parallel from here to finish. You can work on that by posing that spot and then hitting balls from there, right? So I can, I probably start a little short. I'll do this with a seven iron. What the hell? I would probably start a little shorter, but if I went here and I posed a P6, something like this. I'd want the club face slightly tilted down. In, right in line with my hands are just inside. I want my hips to be open at this point, several degrees. My chest and shoulders would be pretty close to neutral from here. And then what I would do from here is push off my right foot, squeeze my legs together, kick my belt buckle up. So if I was P6 here like this and I was open, what I would really be is probably about here, right? So I'm posing this in exaggeration, but I'd really be about here. I'm pushing off my right foot, squeezing my hips um, but push my hips forward, squeezing my butt underneath myself. And you can hit some shots even from a pause spot. So get yourself down here like this, give yourself about a foot or two, right? So that's too far inside. Give yourself about a foot or two and then push off that in the way through. And you can do some little shots there to start with and just learn what that feels like. And then of course you're recording yourself on video. You're not just going by feel that you press, you know, record from face on or down the line, whatever element you're looking for and see if that changes. And then I, what I would do if I was doing that is then slowly start to try and build that into um, your, your swing, right? So maybe you do some, some work like that, get yourself in the spot, feel what that feels like, add a little momentum and hit. And then I might do some little shorties trying to kind of go through those same spots. And then gradually I'm just kind of doing some longer swings, right? I might kind of say, all right, here's what I want to feel about here. I'm going to reset my setup and try and get back to that spot on the way through. So that's how I do it. Always with video. Always, always, always with video. Uh, there's just no sense in not using video. Unless you're lazy. Uh, Andrew, your last video about over hinge was exactly what I needed. Pair that with your video about turning the hips with the alignment rod and the belt loops. And now iron swings, that's beautiful. Love it, excellent. Good, good, good. TJ, how do pros spin the ball back with their wedges instead of hop, skip, and stop? So. The, so the biggest thing that controls spin is friction. You can see the little bugs here. The biggest thing is friction. So the amount of friction between the club and the ball, right? Now, why do pros do that better than amateurs? The main reason is they have new clubs and better clubs and new balls and better balls and better turf and new turf and better greens and perfect conditions. Pros oftentimes did that video between Jason Day and Tiger Woods, and Tiger was saying he goes to like eight, eight to ten new sets of wedges per year. Jason Day was like, "Yeah, I don't really use a lot more." He's like five new sets per year. I got the same wedge for like three years now. So my three-year-old wedge that I've been using all those shots for three years, I don't clean them. I don't have a caddy clean them. The conditions aren't perfect. I, I, I could have the same technique as him. My ball is not going to spin as much. When you see those guys on TV like backspin from sixty yards, that's equipment. Of course, their technique is good. Of course, they hit the ball solid, right? Absolutely. But I could take a NASCAR driver and put them in my Mazda and they're not going 200 miles an hour. Like the, the equipment is really the main deal there. So it's mostly that, TJ. It's much more equipment, much more new wedges, perfect conditions, et cetera, than the technique. When I played college golf at Lehigh, we played at Saucon Valley, which is a really nice country club where I live. And we're here at Muni, right? So Muni conditions in Saucon Valley. I could hit the same wedge shot, same wedge, same conditions at Saucon Valley, that ball would spin back a couple feet, and then here, my ball would bounce forward and roll. Why? Because of the conditions, right? The, the green quality, how fast the greens were, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a lot that. Brian, single digit handicap, but always hang back. No clue how to get weight to left side. Hold finish in balance. Yeah, Brian, it really depends on if you're doing something that's causing that. If you're doing nothing that's causing you to hang back and you're just doing it, that's simple then, right? Like put a club underneath your foot, drop it, get yourself to your left side, record yourself, start slow, exaggerate. The question is, are you doing something that's causing it? Are you doing something at your setup, doing something in your backswing? I'd have to see that, Brian, to be able to say. Um, you can check out kagornogolf.com. For those of you, when I say I need to see your swing, I do mean that. You can check out kagornogolf.com. That's where you can become a premium member. You can post up your swing. I give you feedback. It just depends, Brian, on if there's something causing that or you're just hanging back. A lot of times, a hang, your, your brain makes you hang back as a solution to a problem that it's fixing sort of subconsciously. So I'd have to see that one, really. 
Uh, William, what's up, man? Good evening. Hello, hello. Brett, also thoughts on feel of pause at the top of the swing for someone who gets quick at the top. Yeah, I love that, Brett. I think if you can pause, um, hang on, I'm taking a coffee break. If you can pause at the top of your swing, if you can pause at the top of your swing, I'm back. Um, if you can pause, if you go too fast, I love pausing at the top of your swing. I think you can learn a lot um, about what you need to feel at the top and even get a, a full turn and learn your transition feels with a pause at the top. I don't know that I would play with it, but I mean, in terms of a training thing, absolutely, 100% love that. George Gankis used to do some of those with players. I don't see as much anymore where he'd put the stick on their arms. They go to the top and you kind of feel that the stick stays on to kind of slow the arms and hands down. I had never seen anyone do that before him ever. And I watch a lot of golf videos for the past decade or so, and that really works well. So, so that, that, that would be another one if you want to check out some of his videos. I would change my grip from strong to neutral. Now ball goes right. How? Well, if you used to have a strong grip, that would close the face, right? So if you made a golf swing and with a grip that's strong, let's say V's kind of at your right shoulder, something like that, and you made the same exact golf swing, but you made your grip weaker, what would change? Well, of course, the weaker grip would make the face more open, right? And so the ball would go to the right. So that's all. You just made the same swing, change your grip. So if you're going to change your grip, assuming, let's say you were making a swing and you had a strong grip, okay? You had a strong freaking grip like this. And you're hitting balls and the ball's going dead straight all the time. Well, then your butt shouldn't change your grip. You just keep hitting the ball straight. But if you change your grip, I'm assuming there's a reason why and you were not hitting it well. Maybe you hit it too far left. Said, hey, my grip's strong. I hit it left. I'm going to change it to neutral. Now the ball is going to the right. Well, then you got to find a happy medium. You could keep your new grip that's maybe weaker and you got to learn how to square the face. How? That could be through wrist conditions. You could flex your lead wrist during the backswing. You could flex it more during the downswing. You can add arm rotation, so more supination, kind of uh, back and left hand towards the ground. You can add right arm pronation. Yeah, that's all. You got to do match release pattern. Edward, if you search grip, if you search my name and grip and release, Eric Gorno, grip, release. I have two or three videos that talk through specifically how you need to release the club with each grip pattern. Um, Bob, we'll sign up and send a video. That's a smart man. What do you see as the biggest power leaks in the golf swing opportunities for increased speed? Um, biggest power leaks, I'd say in general, are lack of turn, both back and through. So if I could take every golfer on this range right now or anywhere that's watching and add degrees of turn to your backswing and follow through, collectively we'd hit the ball farther. Because of the lack of turn, there's a bunch of other things that go on that cause problems. The arms bend, the elbows separate, we get narrow, the wrist conditions go off, et cetera. So I'd say turn back and through be the biggest power leaks. Open club face is a tremendous power leak. If I, let's say, Bob, you and I swung a seven iron, you have an open, let's say, let's say a seven iron, um, let's, let, let's say a club that has whatever, seven iron, and you swing with an open club face, and I make the same exact club head speed, but my face is slightly shut. You took your seven iron, let's say we swung 100 miles an hour, and you opened the face, so now it became an eight iron. I took my seven iron, I closed the face, um, so it became a, it became a six iron. So I hit my iron two clubs farther than you just by changing the face angle with the same club head speed. So a lot of times face angle and dynamic loft is more or as important as club head speed. I got this coffee about five minutes ago, I didn't take a sip yet. So I would say um, face, dynamic loft, turn would be the biggest power leaks and then risk conditions for club face. I could take, I show this all the time with people in person, I could take someone's club head speed, take their same iron, get the shaft forward and lower the dynamic loft and hit the ball you know, two, three, four irons farther than them with a little chip shot because of the dynamic law. So turn and dynamic law would be the answers to that. Um, and you should sign up, Bob. If I can see your swing, it's so much easier for me to help you. Uh, let's see, how to stay behind the ball or anchored to the ball with the head and also transfer weight to the left side. So Jay Ricardo, um, one is if you search my name, how does that look right there? If you search my name and head behind the ball, search my name and head behind the ball. There's a 15 minute detailed answer to that specific question. So I won't go through it as much. Um, now, how do you stay behind the ball and get your weight forward? The answer is I stay behind the ball here with right side bend and I can right side bend as I turn and have my weight forward at the same time. I don't stay back. <clears throat> I don't stay back by having my pressure that far back. I can have my pressure forward. Watch my head with the trees. Here's my pressure forward up and down. Here's my pressure forward with the right side bend. See what happened there? Here's my pressure forward. See how my head goes with it if I don't tilt? 
Now I add right side bend, now my head's back. And you're like, wait, that looks goofy. But if I turn, now what does that look like? Perfect. I'm gonna do that one more time for everyone in the back. My pressure can go forward here. Now I'm bending my left leg, putting my pressure forward. As I'm doing that, my head's going down and forward. Now I get my head back by right side bend. So right side crunch, right shoulder close to right hip. Now that looks like a lot of tilt, but if I turn as I do that, that looks like a perfect impact position. So that was, I think, a pretty good answer to that question. That could be a video. Um, let's see. What are your top exercises for golfers? <clears throat> I don't really have a top exercises, to be honest with you. Um, I would say in terms, if you're talking gym exercises, I would do the same exercises as you would in any sort of athletic training. So like when I train in the gym or I send people to tr tr um, trainers, those guys that are, I, I don't really believe so much in sports specific training. Like I don't think you should do golf for golf, at least golf specific. I think you just make yourself a better athlete, explosiveness, speed training, strength training in general. And then in terms of exercises for swing mechanics, that's very individual you and then the people above you or below you might be completely different. So I'd have to see your swing to say like, hey, you should, you like, here's your biggest issue. You can do X, Y, and Z. You can do that at gorgonagolf.com or find a coach. In terms of gym stuff, I would do general athletic stuff, strength training, explosive stuff, compound exercises like that. Lawrence, can you please go over the shoulder tilt as part of the shoulder turn in the back swing? I sure can. So what I would say is number one, if you search Lawrence, if you search my name in shoulder tilt, and shoulders, we did a couple very thorough videos on this. Search my name in shoulders and centered, and I'll go through this in more detail than I'm gonna give you in the next 30 seconds. But basically, and we're gonna do a video on this probably tomorrow. Brian Manzella did a thing, he had this thing that he came out with the other, um, he likes to put um, titles on stuff, which I love, he's funny. And he called it the, um, I think it was the run, I think it was the back up, or run back, run forward and jump. Now I butchered that, but it was something like back up, run forward and jump. Basically what he's talking about is the left shoulder at address is here, during the backswing, it works down and in, like this. During the downswing, it works down and forward, like this. And then from there, it goes up and back, like you're throwing someone off you. So I take my setup, my left shoulder goes down and in, just to the right of where my shirt buttons will be, this way. During my uh, downswing, it goes down and back this way, down and forward. And then once I get to just past kind of 45 degrees close to my shoulders, now it's working up and back this way, here. So from this angle, it goes down and in, it goes down and forward till I get to about 45. And then from there it goes up and back behind you. So that's how the shoulder works from face on. You'll go here, it'll go down and forward behind your shirt buttons. And then what you're basically trying to do is keep your shoulders at about a 90 degree angle to your back line, roughly. Lawrence, if you search my name and um, PGA Tour checkpoints for the swing from face on and down the line, we talk about the shoulder tilt there a little bit more. Hopefully that helps. We're gonna do more videos on that tomorrow. Um, when I get nervous, I don't open my hips on backswing, then slice and get quick tempo. If I think about it, I'll over rotate and snap hook help. Yeah, I don't know that there's a simple solution for that one, man. I think that that's, I'd have to see your swing. Like those things you're saying, I don't know if those are feels or are those real? Do you feel like you don't open your hips in your backswing? Is that really what happens? Do you slice because of that? Do you slice because of something else? If you're slicing your club faces open, which is the most important thing, whether you open your hips or not, your club face is open if you're hitting a slice. Um, in terms of the quick tempo part, that could be something you could fix by breathing, getting present, like that's another sort of topic. Um, and then if you think about it and you over rotate and snap hook, then you need to find a middle ground. Really the solution there is you need to work with a coach or figure out what your main priorities are that you, why you cause a slice. Eliminate that and fix that have feels that you work on. You also then need to put yourself in that environment more often. So when you get nervous, how do you fix that? You don't fix it. You put yourself in a situation where you get nervous so many times in a row where it's easier to handle. That's it. Now you can breathe, you can get present and handle it better, but you need to get yourself nervous more often, find feels and solutions, and then rinse and repeat that. So when you get into the environment that actually matters, you've done it enough. That's the real solution. That might mean doing shit on the range where you're betting someone, whatever, whatever, whatever you can do to make you nervous, playing people you don't know. Um, but that's really the deal. But if you're slicing the ball, because the face is open. That may or may not be related to your hips. I'd have to see. Stuart, changing my full swing to L to L, a bit like John Rahm. Could you tell me the best way to start the downswing for more consistent as well as distance? Stuart, I would say starting the downswing is pretty much irrelevant to the way you go back in general. Meaning, like, let's let's say John, I, I, I get what you're asking, but let's say John Rahm's like here. Let's say Dustin Johnson's here. 
let's say Rory's here, let's say Jack Nichols is here, whatever, they all more or less start their downswing the same, right? So like, as long as you're in a somewhat neutralist position, regardless of risk conditions and club face, as long as it's not stupid, like you, they're more or less doing the same thing, right? They're shifting pressure in the left leg, their lead legs working external, the pelvis is going down and forward, their right side's turning, their shoulders going down and forward, and then they're turning and then they're coming up and back out. So they're shifting pressure and turning to start the downswing, whether you're gonna be John Rahm at the top or Freddie Couples, they're kind of all still starting down the same in reality. Now, what you may have to feel in particular compared to where you're at could be completely different. I have to know more details there to kind of throw something out there, but big picture, what you should do is the same as everybody else. Been working on your on, been working on your most recent backswing improvement videos. Seem to be in my forward bend too long on my backswing. When should thoracic extension happen? Larry, I would say you're kicking in thoracic from about left arm parallel to the top. From about left arm parallel to the top is when you're kicking in thoracic. In general, now if you go like this, Larry, if you go here, watch my head in the back. If you move off super early, then you throw it in, that'll get you back to centered. If you wanna not move off at all, you may have to feel like you're throwing it in right away, okay? What you wanna do, Larry, search my name and centered. If you get a sun behind you, and put your shadow in front of you and put a ball right in front of it and do drills where you see your head on the ball and actually hit a ball if you can. If you're in an environment where you get a sun behind you, see your shadow, put a ball down, watch your head in the shadow, keep it centered and hit balls. That will give you the real answer to what your feels need to be regardless of what I say. You just wanna keep your head in the circle, right? So I would say left arm parallels where you kick it in, but if you go off early, you gotta do it earlier. Strong grip or neutral grip, which grip is best for mid to low handicap golfers? Neither. Um, mean or or either so i don't think strong or neutral is necessarily better the stronger your grip is the more speed you need to be able to support less dynamic loft and handle more forward the lower your speed is um, the more neutral grip may benefit you because you can you have more dynamic loft to get the ball high enough to carry far enough so if you have enough speed you can use any grip john rom super weak grip 20 million a year is cool you got DJ's a little stronger, right? You got Roy a little more this way. So if you have enough speed, you can do whatever you want. I'd say if your speed's a little lower, you might wanna look to go a little bit more neutral with your grip pattern. It also depends on your wrist conditions and what you like to feel up top. How much can you turn or not turn? Like if you, the stronger your grip pattern is gonna be, the more you need to have the handle forward, the more you need to open up and, and et cetera, et cetera. So it can be good to match with that pattern. If you can get your body open, if you physically or whatever, can't figure out how to do that, a weaker, grip pattern will allow more, add more flex and supination. You can use more arms and hands, which is not incorrect and play excellent golf that way and shoot 65 like that. So I'd say it's specific, kind of person to person. You're not alone. One of Jack Nicklaus swing thoughts forever was complete the back. Oh, you're not alone. One of Jack Nicklaus swing thoughts forever was complete the back swing. How about that? Yeah, that's, yeah, if it's that easy, that's like Burst Kepka says all the time, he goes in the course and doesn't think ever and just hits balls. That doesn't work for me. I need to think about something. But if you can not think and hit it great, excellent. If you can think back, so you're great, awesome. You gotta really figure out what your main things are and then work those. I don't have any issues getting out of the green side bunker, but need technique drills to control distance similar to wedge system. Yeah, the real answer to that is you need to go into a bunker and put a object on the green and hit a lot of balls until you figure out what that is and then move that object three yards by and hit a lot of balls until you figure what that is and move an object ball. If you, I'm not sure your name is here, but if you, um, if I gave you a, 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 let's say a thousand bunker shots per week for the next four weeks and you just did that drill, you would find your solution to it. So that's really the um, answer to that. Now you might find from there that you like, at, like hitting it farther by adding swing length. You might open the face a little less you might add more speed in the follow through. You might take more club. There's different options you can do like that, but you, you, that's like chipping landing zones. How do you get really good at chipping landing zones around the green? You need to do them. You, know, you need to do chipping landing zones a bunch. Whereas the wedge distance control is a little more like put a spot in. You still got to do that a bunch, but within like one or two practice sessions, you could probably find a good spot. Bunker, in my opinion, because there's more moving variables, it kind of it probably takes a little bit longer for that. Um, Jim, have you finalized any plans for coming down to Florida in the winter? Can't wait to meet you. We're still working on it now, but I mean, it's we're, we're going to be there in like January, February for sure. 
And then March, I think, is a little up in the air. And where we're going to be and when we're going to be, we're still figuring out. But we will be there January, February in some way, shape, or form, somewhere, somehow, PGA show. some way. You'll be at the PGA show for sure in Orlando for those two weeks. Um, we'll be down there. Um, I need you for about a week in the North Atlanta area. It's going to cost you big bucks, dude. Big bucks one-on-one -on -one for a week. Uh, Dennis, tilt in my backswing does a lot of good things for me. But on video, I'm still not there. What are the baby steps to work on it? I've heard you say to work on it. You need to record yourself consistently, just like showering, just like brushing your teeth, eating vegetables, and you need to exaggerate. You need to record yourself and exaggerate. So what would that process look like? You'd get to the range, you'd pull your club out, you'd pull your live view or video in front of you. Uh, let's assume you're doing, uh, I think you said tilt. Okay, so let's say you're filming from down the line and you're looking for the tilt to be 90 to your back line. You start a couple swings, you videotape yourself, you see, oh my gosh, I am not tilted enough, Dennis. What am I going to do? You go back up to the next ball. You then exaggerate your tilt to the point in your mind where you're like, there's no way this isn't going to be enough tilt. This is definitely enough. You go back to the video, you watch, you say, oh my God, Dennis, I still haven't tilted enough. What do I do? You go back up to the ball. You say, this is it. I'm going to tilt so much that there's no way. And then you go back to the video and it's perfect. And there you found your feels for right now. You continue that. You keep the video on. You continue exaggerating. That's your day. You go back three days later, hit balls again. And guess what? You got to do that all over again. You're going to go in there. You're going to exaggerate. It's not going to be enough. You got to go back in. You do more. And that's how you do it. You rinse and you repeat. That's the real answer to it, right? That's not the like lose weight with a pill thing. That's like go in the gym and work really hard every day. That's kind of how that needs to work with video. I can shower the club, but the weight causes my release pattern to change where my right wrist release is under my left. This leaves the face wide open, especially with my driver. Any thoughts or fixes? So I can shallow the club, but the weight causes my release pattern to change. My right wrist is under my left. This leaves the face wide open. So if you can shallow the club, again, depends on kind of how you do it. Let's say you get the club behind you. I think you're saying you're like this, and then maybe you're like this. Is it kind of what I'm assuming? So if you go back like this, again, I have to see. It depends on how you're doing it. If you're going to get the club this far behind you, you then have to tumble it later. Okay, so it's got to go behind you early, and then it can't keep going behind you forever. You're going to be too far under plane. Now, that's an okay problem to have if you're coming from too steep. Like if you're, if you're too steep this way, then you want to get under and kind of flip draw it for a while and then learn how to rotate. But eventually, really, if you watch like a Sergio, he lays it down kind of under the plane and then he gets it back on top of the plane. Now, how does he do that? He does that through rotation. He tips the shaft back over. There's risk conditions to it, right? You can, as you go back, add some flex this way. Boom. You can add some flex this way to get that, um, get that club to get a little bit more on top and keep your wrist back. You can feel like your right wrist goes a little bit more from here, goes a little bit more on top of it. So your kind of forearm gets a little more on top of it. Your palm gets a little bit more kind of down to the ground. That'll get the club tipping back over later. Things like that can help if you're too far underneath. Um, but again, if you're coming from too steep, I wouldn't rush to fix that. You can flip hook your way to really good golf. You remind me of Rocco Mediate when you speak. I'll take that. Thank you very much. I've heard that before. What's the best tips for taking spin off driver into the wind? Club head speed 105. Uh, spin off driver, my best tips are you got to figure out why you have too much spin. Like, it just all depends, man. Just like, why might you have too much spin? You might be hitting too far down on the ball. You might be hitting the ball too low on the driver face. You might have too much dynamic loft. Like ideally you'd hit a little bit up on it and keep the, and kind of de-loft it a little or keep the loft neutral and lower the spin loft, right? So angle of attack and dynamic loft make this angle. The lower you make that, the spin goes lower, right? So if you could hit up and keep the, the loft a little lower, you need speed for that. Like you said, 105. So yeah, it, how do you take spin off the um, driver into the wind? Ideally you learn how to hit up and keep the loft low. The question is, how do you do that? Well, I'd have to see what you're currently doing. What I would do to do that is move the ball a little far, like maybe a little farther back in my stance, get the handle forward, but make sure I'm getting the handle up and left, right? So for me to kind of take the spin off, I would want to feel, I don't know if I have a T, I would want to feel like my handle works more up and left. That's how I can de-loft it and keep the spin down. So let's say this is my normal driver here, right? Let's say it's my normal driver. Past impact, the more my hands work up and left, 
this way. I can get the handle forward, keep the loft down and hit up. See, look at the butt of the club. See, that's even with my thigh here. Now watch that impact and past impact. See, it's even with my hip. My hands work up past impact. My left shoulder works up and back. So if I wanted to take the spin off, I get my hands working up and left with my left shoulder. Let's go ahead and do one. So into the wind, ball's a little bit farther back. I'm gonna feel up and left with my hands, take the spin off. This should cut a little bit. Yeah, and that was perfect. So that's how you do it. Again, that's stock general, dude. I'd have to like see, you know, why you have too much spin. Swing easy when it's breezy. Yes, sir, easy peasy. When it's breezy like that, take more club, middle of the green, you know what I'm saying? Hopefully you have a swing distance system in. You don't have to be guessing on that. Watch many videos of you teaching how to tr how to try to get steeper in the takeaway and shallow of the follow through, but seem to have changed my path. Um, out in what gives. Watched many videos of you teaching how to get steeper in the takeaway and shallow in the follow through, but seem to have changed my path out to in what gives. Yeah, Aaron. Again, I mean, I'd have to see, right? So. I'd rather not guess. All of you guys, when you post these questions, ideally from here, you check out kogornogolf.com. It's 39 bucks, not 3,900, $39 per month. And you post videos up and then I can actually see and answer them and help you change it. This whole shaft deal is, is important, but it's only part of the deal. So the, the idea here is this, that he's talking about. During the backswing, my club's on a plane. The more vertical, vertical the shaft is, okay? the more it wants to go this way in transition downswing. The more horizontal it is during the backswing, the more it wants to steepen during the downswing. So the more vertical it is going back, it wants to go this way. The more horizontal it is, it wants to go this way. But there's also depth, okay? So if I go back and I make a backswing, yeah, there's verticality, but I also have to get enough depth to my hands. I need my hands to work over my toe line through my pec and bicep and over my trail shoulder. So the idea would be have the club head even with my hands at first parallel, have the butt of the club inside the ball line here, not by a lot, but just by a little, and then deep enough here, then I'm set up to go this way when I work down. If I just go, if I get the shaft vertical, but I'm here, well then I, that doesn't do anything for me. I still need to get depth. So I would say without seeing, if I had to guess, I'd say you don't have enough depth during your backs with your arms and hands, and also you need enough turn, you need enough turn to get enough depth to swing more from inside. Now, you may get the shaft vertical, get depth, and still swing over the top, okay? None of this shit's guaranteed. I can eat really good for a whole month and still get sick. It's just prepping yourself to do the, give you the easiest chance you're downswing. If you're too over the top or too far out the end, then just put a station in, right? So take your setup here like this. Um, so if you watch, if you search, um, search my name and best drill I've ever seen or shallow your downswing, something like that, that stick, Aaron, that stick drill behind the ball, I don't have one down there, but if you put a stick in like this and angled it down and then you got to swing underneath it or the only three drills you'll, you ever need, any of those drills like that, if you set them up properly, you won't be over the top regardless of your backswing. How early are you doing lessons back in PA in 2020? Reverse slice sequence has taken me from 105 to a new low of 92. Excellent, man. Congratulations. I'd like to get an hour next year. Um, definitely in April, well, barring, barring something or like injury or something crazy, April is kind of what I think we'll end up doing. Uh, maybe part of March, um, but I think April. But we're gonna go travel a lot and if we like it somewhere else, I don't know, maybe I won't move back here. So you might, you might have to fly somewhere. No, pro probably April is probably like safe bet. Uh, quit the Cubs and you'll drop another four to six shots, that's perfect. I haven't watched like an inning of baseball this year. It's bad. Yeah, I've got, it's bad. It's not good. Okay, on, Mike Weaver, on my driver, I'm either hitting a push fade or pull. Help. So a push fade or a pull. Well, it really depends, Mike, on why that's happening. Like there's just too many variables for me to make a guess there. There's some of these, there's some of these, like, I hate guys. I don't mean to like answer them like, oh, I need to see it. You know what I mean? Like check out the site. Like I say that because I mean that. There's some of these questions where, I just, there's too many guesses, like, and I don't mean you in particular, Mike, but you know, for you to hit a pull and a push fade, I mean, there's just, there could be so, there could be several things that could cause that. And a put, so if you said to me, Hey, I hit a push or a hook, that's like, all right, dude, you're past too far inside out. 
boom, 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 done. Now there might be other things that would help. Maybe your grip is too strong, so your face is too shut, that's why you're past too far inside out. Maybe your ball's too far back, that's why you're past too far inside out. Maybe you aim, whatever. A push fade and a pull, okay? Normally, now a, a pull pattern, if you just hit a straight pull, would be a downswing path where the club gets a little too far on top of the plane or outside, and then you kind of square the face to it, and then you hit a straight pull. A push fade could happen with any path. I could be inside and push fade it. I can be perfectly neutral and push fade it. I can be steep and push fade it. The fact that you hit some straight full, uh, fools, hello, the, the fact you hit some straight pulls to the left would lead me to believe, um, who's that, who's that, was that, was that um, Jaws that used to do the video thing? I believe, I watched 2,000 hours of video, I believe. So during the downswing, that, that would lead me to think that you would be more kind of over the plane and kind of pull it to the left. And every once in a while, your face is open and you push cut it. Now that's a guess though, you know, it's an educated guess. So I'd have to see it to say for sure. If I could see your swing on video, I could tell you really easily, but I need to see it. So that would be a guess. So I'd say maybe downswing, um, swing direction. What I would do if I were you and you're hitting driver, I would eliminate the push fade Unless you want to hit a fade, it depends on what you want to hit. Okay, if you want to hit a fade, I would eliminate one of those two misses is kind of where I'm going. I would probably eliminate the push fade, keep the pull, and eliminate the curve, and then fix the pass stuff. So like, figure out why your face gets open when you hit a push fade. That might just be you're hitting it off center on the heel. Figure out why the face is open, and get all the balls not curving, and then fix the path part is what I would do. Okay, hello, 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 Santiago, how are you? Matt, in the compression videos for irons, will the same release pattern be for the driver? No, maybe, depends on your speed. So for an iron, and actually we have a video coming out in the next two weeks with Marty that's iron versus driver swing that we'll go through this uh, in detail. Matt, so you see it? The iron swing, you're looking for uh, ball be farther back in your stance, so it won't be as far forward. I have less tilt at address. Balls on the ground need to hit down. Backswing, not that much different than driver. Iron swing, the left shoulder is going to, and head are going to move down and forward more than the driver. I'm going to try and get my shoulder more forward of the ball. I'm going to have the shaft a little more forward, a little bit more lean this way. Driver, ball more forward, more tilt, head more back. I'm going to keep my head more back with the driver, not have my handle as far forward. Now, you can keep these same wrist conditions. You can keep this flat to bow, this bend back at the handle forward, the driver like a Dustin Johnson versus Kepka, if you have a lot of speed, okay? Any good players you see with the handle way forward, the facial like that, that are really good, have a lot of speed. Or if they do that and they don't have speed, they'll hit it straight, but short, okay? So it all depends what your things are. Like there's some girls in the LPGA Tour who have a strong grip pattern, have more of this, and they have that release pattern and they hit 80% of the fairways, but then they hit it like 210, 220, right? So if, they, if you want more speed, you have to let that throw more. So yeah, if you have enough speed, you can keep that. If not, you gotta have a little bit more um, throw, a little bit more uh, ex uh, flexion with the right hand, a little bit more extension with the left, kind of let the club head go a little bit more at the driver because you need more loft to get the ball to travel high enough and go uh, far enough. So that's the answer. Paul, can you demonstrate Matt Wolf's swing and why if you were young and flexible, why you wouldn't try and adopt the power tanks? Paul, I think, I think you commented on one of the uh, YouTube videos earlier today, and I um, said back to you about the hinge part and the flexion part. I don't know if you commented back and didn't see the things today, but what I was saying to you before when you said about, I was showing it with this, you can't, the, the, the flexing and hinging part go together. Like if I max flex my wrist, it, I, I can very, hinge very little. And if I, if I hinge the most, I will always automatically cut that. And so those two things go together. I, I'm not going to flex it and hinge at the same time, right? That's all I was saying with that, which is like those two things in time So can you demonstrate Matt Wolf's swing and if, why if you're flexible? So I don't know if I can demonstrate. Um, he goes, he goes, so what does he do? He goes re really this way, right? And then he kind of really rotates. He really, he got a really weak grip and he curls it under. So he goes like this and then kind of curls it and rotates really hard. Ooh, I hit that chunky. So maybe something like that. Why would I not do that? Well, if I, it's like a Jim Furyk thing. Jim Furyk hits the ball excellent. He's got a really goofy swing. He hits it in the middle of the face. I gotta do that better than that. He hits it in the middle of the face. He's made like $100 million probably, but he's got a big loop. Now, 
if someone came up and they were doing that, I wouldn't. All right, that was better. Um, if Matt Wolf came up to my lesson, okay, and he said, Eric, I'm Matt Wolf, check out my swing, and I want to get better. And I saw his tournament resume and I watched him hit balls and I watched him play. Anyone, right, with logic wouldn't change, like I wouldn't change that. Wouldn't change anything like that. I've had many people come to me who are good tournament players that have goofy looking swings that don't succeed because of their swing. Like if they don't play well, it's not because they're swing mechanics. So I wouldn't ever change that. But why would I not teach it? Um, obviously, it's about really far. So there's benefit of that. There's a lot of moving parts. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. But if I could teach someone, I would probably get them more neutral and have less work to do. Now, I like a lot of what George does and a lot of his the shaft get more vertical, deeper hand path, bigger turn, right? Really good leg work. Obviously, a lot of his guys hit it really far. And so I like that. I think the more you can do that, the better. Obviously, his distance is at a premium with uh, playing in tournaments. So, yeah, I wouldn't not teach it, but I wouldn't necessarily teach it to everyone. I think it works for him. I think it's a lot of those pieces are really good, and he really replanes it great coming down. If you look at him from, like, here, it's kind of down and through. It's, like, freaking unbelievable. So... So let's see here. But it's the same thing, like 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 Adam Scott, you know? If Adam Scott walks on your range as a young kid, are you putting him in a Matt Wolf swing or are you leaving him Adam Scott? You know what I'm saying? If uh, Ray Floyd walks in, he's inside like this and goes steep, and he's Ray Floyd, do you do you loop him this way? For, you know what I mean? So I, I think it really depends, Paul, on the person in front of you, and you kind of change it um, to them. Uh, benefits of a heavier club. It depends on who you talk to. I've seen studies before where heavier shafts and heavier clubs have improved club head speed for people. They've lowered spin for people, better um, ball flight trajectory wise, optimizing landing angles. But then I've seen other reports where they show other things. I'm not a big club fit, club fitter. Um, I know enough that I drive to a club fitter and then I do club champion and then come back home. Um, so I've seen things on different ends of it, but I would always just get a fitting and see what they kind of max out and put you into. I went to club champion to get my Mizuno driver and it's probably, it's probably the most, the best club I've ever had. It's also the only club I've ever got fit, like fully fit that I bought. Um, so that goes to show you something. I became a tad confused with squat to square. For me, it creates a stop in the swing. You reckon getting open as early as possible is the way to go. And I feel real good when it happens. Yeah. So you know, the, the idea when you're doing your downswing pieces, even though you might practice it in several parts, it's really one motion, right? I've never seen a PGA Tour player. The only player I've ever seen pause like that is Charles Barkley, and he's awful, right? So I've never seen a PGA Tour player hit a ball where they go, okay? I see Victor Hovland pause up here. I see Hideki Matsuyama pause up there. But as a drill thing, you can train it in, but it's really one motion, right? We did a video during the downswing about the hips and stuff and kind of shift versus turn. And the idea is, listen, you're going to shift – and you're going to turn and you have to combine those two together. The goal is the walls on the outside of your foot. You got to get your belt buckle there by the time you get into the follow through. So depending upon what you have too much of, if you have too much slide, if you have too much lateral left hip into it, you need to feel more pure turn or maybe even more this way. If you have too much pure turn and you hang back the whole time, you got to feel more slide as you go forward. Again, those are feels. The reels on video, if you watch good players, Go on YouTube and pull up a slow-mo of any PJ Tour player from face on. Watch their pelvis motion, their left hip motion. None of them go back. None of them stay exactly where they are. They all go forward, every single one of them, every single one of them, and they all turn, every single one of them. And almost, they virtually all end up with the belt buckle on that wall. So how you get there, what you need to do, depends on where you're coming from. Again, you only need to feel something like this, okay? Like, I like that feel that I've seen from George about getting the – left knee at the target and kind of if you were the mirror if i was going towards you which we'll probably do a video on this too getting a left knee at the target and being able to see the right quad see how open that is like that feels really good for me now i normally go this way okay i normally go this way i was taught into slide jump okay this way so that's for me feels really good if you slide too much those sort of feels but it's really just one motion right so if i'm doing that motion for example i'm doing that same thing i would feel that as a little drill, so let's do one here. I would feel that as a drill. This let's do is do a little George move. I'm feeling my kneecap to the target, and then as if you'd be able to see my right quad, like my quad is showing to the target. I'm feeling like from there, my kneecap is pointing towards you, and my quad's pointing towards you. Now, what I'll feel as I'm hitting is that I'm doing that 
in a fluid motion. Like I'm doing that as a motion here, kneecap to the target. And then a ball flat in my pocket, kneecap to the target, and then my quad forward. And I hit that perfect. I'm feeling it like this here, two parts, but really from here, I'm just trying to get there. Now, why for me can I feel just that and no lateral? When I just, I just got done saying, it's turn and shift. I can feel pure turn because I already got too much shift. So I don't need to think shift, it's already happening. Now, if that's for you, that's all you gotta do is feel pure turn. You're gonna already shift by yourself, right? So it's all a matter of um, where you're coming from. I'm gonna do that again. So I'm feeling kneecap to the target, quad showing, love that feel from him. And I'm gonna feel the same thing as I work down. I will tell you. Not as good as the first one, but that feel for me feels really good. That was not a rapid answer. <laughs> Jeremy, what's up? Hopefully you had a uh, safe trip back home. We got no audience back here this time. Um, member number 16, a oh, member number 16. To everyone watching this and contemplating whether to join kogornogolf.com, stop stalling and just do it. Uh, you will not make a better investment in your golf game. Appreciate that, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Member number 16. I wonder who was number who was the number one? Like, yeah. Like Jeremy, OG. Hope you had a safe trip back, my friend. We enjoyed our time together. Uh, Ian, what's the stock finish wrist position for chipping? Do you release or hold the wrist? That's a good question. It depends on what kind of shot pattern you're trying to hit. So let's do this. Oh, by the way, my buddy, um, who we're gonna go see and do some videos with. I don't know if you guys know AMG Athletic Motion Golf. My buddy, Sean Webb, you can see this here, came out with a putting mirror that we're gonna use in some of our videos we're gonna use. If you guys need a putting mirror, I've used some of these in the past. I like the way he designed this really well. If you go online and search Sean Webb, S-H-A-U-N-W-E-B-B, -B, he used a putting mirror. Like if you guys need a little putting mirror to practice at home, um, you wanna check that out. Sean, we're gonna go down and do some videos with Athletic Motion Golf over the uh, winter time. If you guys have any stuff you wanna see, you can post it in here. Chipping release patterns. So it depends on what kind of shot you hit. Um, Ian, if you search my name and chipping and chipping trajectories and wedges and wedge trajectories, you'll get a more thorough uh, explanation than this. But really the answer is if you wanna go low, you would go like this. Medium would be like this. High would be like this. Low, medium, high. Okay. And so when I'm chipping those, if I want to go low, I want to have the butt of the club farther away from me and keep the club head below my hands like this. Cause if I took that same thing and I brought it back to impact, there's my shaft lean for my low shot. If I want to go medium, it's club head at or just above my hands, butt of the club close. Cause if I bring that back, that's pretty much neutral 90. If I want to go high, I would go here. Cause if I brought that back, that'd be shaft behind for a flop shot. So low, medium high normal from here would be about like this about like this that'd be about a normal finish about like this depending upon what i want to do if i want to use more bounce i might have the face more open and keep the club a little bit more to the right it's just different but if you search the chipping videos they should show you that i gotta go faster some people are watching like no don't go faster you talk so fast already travis hey eric i'm still trying to shadow the club shallow the club i'm assuming in transition, it seems to require a lot of timing between letting the club shallow and my body rotate. Is this normal? It's normal to feel like that, Travis, if you normally are too steep, yeah. Anything that's different than your normal is gonna feel timing, exaggerated, what the hell's going on, awkward. The key is you have to film it, okay? So you check where you're actually going because the feels are shit. The feels are irrelevant. Feels don't matter for you, me, or anyone else. What matters is what are you actually doing, using that feel as a measuring stick and then adjusting, right? And so I would make sure you're recording your swing, Travis, work with a coach ideally to work you through the process or when you need to. And um, that's, that, that is normal to feel that, right? For sure normal. So I have to see you doing it to say, hey, yes, that's correct or no, that's not, or do it this way, but that is normal. George, how many swing thoughts do you have in your head when hitting a tee shot or any shot on the course? Well, it depends. We were just out playing today and Mary and I were talking about that. Right now, I was on vacation with my mom for a couple of days. Mary was at the beach for a couple of days. And I haven't played now in like two weeks, right? I haven't played a hole in two weeks. In season, we were doing our own course stuff. We were doing golf schools and our Mondays. I was playing nine holes three times a week. Nine holes on Thursday with the school, nine holes Friday with the school, and nine or maybe three with Mary. So I was probably playing 20, 25 holes a week. 
So I had a good feel, like I was working on backswing depth and, or backswing turn and depth. That's kind of, that's what I've been working on since the winter. I've been working with JT, JT Thomas, who's based down in Miami, who does the schools with us. I was working on with him with my backswing. I was feeling that all year. Now the past couple of weeks I haven't played. Like I play Monday and then I don't play for two weeks and I play and then I don't play for two weeks. So I didn't have much. So today I went on the course, no swing thoughts. And I was just trying to hit a shot. Like I was trying to fade every ball. So if I haven't played in a while or I'm rusty or don't have it, I will just play a shot pattern, George. Like, I, like, like no swing. Now for me, when I'm doing a fade, I feel like I open my feet, face is open and I swing really far left and hold the face open. That's what it feels like. I have feels, okay, but I'm not trying to a swing thought. So this whole year though, from like April through August, every shot I hit, my thoughts were full turn, arms deep. Now in April, that felt like this, just a ridiculous turn. And my arm felt like it was going like across my body like this. That's what my swing felt like in April. In May, it felt like a eh, pretty big turn, deep. In June, it felt normal, turn, deep. In July, it's very rarely a thought. And then we started not playing as much. And now it's kind of hitting shots. So I think one to two uh, swing thoughts is fine. I think having thoughts on the course is fine and maybe even necessary. I also think it's okay when you're off, like Justin uh, Thomas, the one tournament, a couple tournaments back, he was like, I had the worst range session of the year. I just went out and hit shots and he shot like 60 or 62 or whatever. So like today we went out and played, I had every fairway, every green. I think I had every fairway, every green. Played six holes at every fairway, every green. Haven't played in two weeks. Swing felt awful. I just faded every ball. I didn't try and do anything fixed. I just faded it. Now I practice enough where I have a fade. Okay. I can own that shot pattern. I put the work in to get that. So you got to get to that point. Ian, what are your thoughts on spiked versus spikeless shoes, especially on tougher lies? I never wear spikes. I wear sneakers. I think it's fine. I don't get any benefit from it. I could be convinced otherwise with a good argument. Uh, thanks for the tips. You're welcome. When are you coming to Alberta, Canada? No plans, dude. We're going south, not north. So you might be in trouble. Really hope to do in first lesson with you. Yeah, maybe we can get together. Like I said, yeah, if you want to come to Florida or California or Texas, we're going to start our traveling process this year. I would imagine moving forward, we'll do more of that. But I don't know about Canada, man. Maybe, maybe during the hot summer. What are your thoughts on the Tour Striker plane mate? I like it. I like Martin Chuck a lot. We like the people at Tour Striker. I've only used it once. I uh, hit about 10 balls with it. We need to use it more. We're hopefully going to go out and see Martin and do some videos in November. Um, so I need to use it a little bit more. My initial thoughts were I like it, but I need, I need to use it more. I uh, just got mine, like the way it feels. Yeah, most people seem to like it. I, I, I liked it, but I need more, like I said. Uh, my day was good, my friend. Hopefully you too. Robbie, good video on downswing. Belt buckle into wall. When do you start the movement of the lead leg and hip turn shift at the top of backswing or before? Well, Robbie, that's a tough one. It depends on like, if you measure it, a lot of guys are starting the pressure shift forward before they finish the backswing, okay? That's literal. The issue that I have with people trying to do that, most people I see do that, then they end up not getting a full turn. They go back, they say, all right, I'm supposed to start shifting here. And then they never get a full shoulder turn, which means they don't get enough depth and enough swing length to get the club back inside on the way down. So I would prefer you get a good full turn up to the top, get good depth, and then initiate the downswing from that spot. Um, so that's what I would do it like that. Technically it could be happening earlier, but I'm probably, you're feeling that as you start the downswing, right away as you start the downswing, kind of before the arms and hands come down. That's not literal, the arms and hands come down. Okay, it just feels, goodness. Eight people will send me a message about that. No, 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 that's not right. <laughs> Hi Eric, basic question. I've heard this me uh, mentioned both ways. As a rule, should your head always be behind the ball at address and at impact? So it depends on what club you're hitting. Driver, yes. Iron, no. So if you look at, um, if you search my name and head behind the ball, it talks about, I think it talks about the driver. It might talk about iron. With an iron motion, if I'm hitting the ball off the ground, if you look at like the Adam Scott video we use all the time, his head will be normal, minimal tilt with a short iron, stays pretty level, and then it moves down and forward of the line, and then it basically stays on that line. Now it does that so I can get my lead shoulder, my sternum forward to get the handle forward to hit down on it. If I'm going driver and you watch the Justin Thomas video we did, his head would be tilted back more, stays back, might go down and forward a little, but then he goes back, 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 home run. And that way, and that's what most of the players do to hit up on the ball. So uh, shorter iron ball on the ground, left shoulder and head more down and forward, driver up in the air to maximize distance, head more back. So they're different. Good question. 
Max, how can one prevent from being too much externally rotated at the top and therefore being too steep in the downswing? So if you're too far externally rotated at the top, okay, you're too far externally rotated at the top, like this way, and that leads to here, if that's, if that's a problem, then you would want to get more internally rotated. So your right arm kind of um, elbow more out, flying right arm, and then try and get your kind of forearm parallel to your spine line and get this arm um, parallel with the ground. See what I'm saying there? So if you wanted a more flying right arm look, you'd go more here, which would be, this is even with the ground. This is not even, this is above. This would be parallel with the ground. And then your forearm would be about parallel with your spine line. That'd be a good checkpoint for the right arm at the top, right about like that. Also some nice width there. Now that would allow you to do the external rotation and transition. That'd be more again, like a kind of a George Jankis model. He would get the, the arm like that, but those would be the checkpoints for that. Um, we did a video on shallow, uh, two simple feels to shallow your down. So one, if you, the thumbnail was me with my arm up like this, my biceps looking good today. My, my arm up like this at the top. We did a video on that. That's kind of how you would do that. You could put a glove underneath your arm like this or a head cover and drop it on your way back. People want drills, right? I gotta start getting drills, I guess. You go like this and let it fly out. If you kept it in, you'd be externally rotated. Mizuno head cover, keep it in, external rotation. Mizuno head cover, let it out, flying right arm. And boom. I really struggle with consistency. I generally hit a snap, pull hook. When things go badly, I feel, I feel cause I don't, I feel cause I don't have a natural ball flight when I'm playing well as a straight ball. Um, yeah, so struggling with consistency, snap hook, I'd have to see the mechanics. If you struggle with consistency and ball flight pattern, I have to see why that is, I have to see a video of your swing. I, I don't know what kind of wild guess to throw out, but if you had a snap pull hook, either your face gets really jacked up and closed, your face gets really closed to the path, or if it's a drive, you're hitting toe ball. So either you're hitting off center with a toe, you're getting quick sniper, or your face gets too shot. I have to see why that would be the case. Um, Abra, is that how you say that maybe? I have to see a video of your swing. Uh, Richard, how do I get my shaft plane more vertical on backswing and the feel of my wrist at the top of the swing? So how you do it and what you need to, so what you need to feel is very much dependent on what you're currently doing, Richard. Imagine, imagine I see your swing and you do this and you say, Hey, what do I need to feel to go vertical? Or I see your swing and you do this, or you do this. What I would tell you are three completely different things. So what you need to feel, I cannot say, because I need to see where you're at. CoronaGolf.com, premium membership. Okay. Now, how you get more vertical, the goal is you want to get the club in line with your hands. You want to get the hands in line with the pec bicep, get the butt of the club down this way and over the shoulder. Now, feels for that, assuming you're kind of this way, again, it just depends. I mean, if you watch our takeaway videos, um, if you search my name and takeaway, you'll see some of that. You might want to feel from here like the elbow, right? The left elbow points more down towards the ground. The butt of the club points down towards the ground. The back of your left hand points straight this way. If you were to be more flat, your elbow would point over there. The back of the left hand would be up and the shaft would be this way. So if you want to go more vertical, you'd want to go more left elbow down. You kind of hold your elbow with your right hand or above your elbow and make some back swings and feel what that feels like. Get the elbow down and get the butt of the club down, back your hand that way. But again, what you need to feel depends on where you're at, man. Philip, can't stop rolling my wrist inside. How can I fix? Search my name and take away. You see several videos on how to fix that. Robbie, what is the feel of the hands at impact of where they should be? If I'd address that inner thigh, how far forward should it feel at impact? Over the left thigh or over the left shoe is a good marker. What you need to feel depends on where you're coming from. Theme of the day. Philip, keep rolling my arms and hands to the inside of the takeaway. How can I fix? Search my name and take away several drills. We have probably four or five videos. Troubleshoot your takeaway. Only two drills you need. Only four drills you need. Only three drills you need. We've got lots of takeaway videos on how to fix that. You can put the shaft down the club, right? You can do one of these jobbers. Um, alignment rod down the club on your left hip. Roll that down your thigh, get it to go up. Club on the left hip, roll it down your thigh, get it to go up. You can, what you need to do if you roll is feel like you never roll and record yourself and it'll probably look perfect and then adjust and exaggerate, right? 
Eric, can lack of hip rotation in the backswing lead to early extension? Yes. I'm going to rapid fire here now. Robbie, when pitching, should I have some hip turn on backswing? A little bit. How does it affect the ball flight if I tend to turn my shoulders on a flatter plane? Depends on what else. Nothing stock, I would say, with that. Uh, Miguel, love your video. Thank you, sir. Oh, man, I'm way behind here. Miguel, I'm going to, I'm sorry guys, this is going to be quick here. Love your video. Very clear and detailed. Can't hit my low irons four to five, even my life depending on it. Cogornogolf.com, post a video up, 39 bucks, I'll help you. David, having trouble rotating my shoulders because I'm so stiff. Is there a way to correct this? Um, search my name in Senior Golfer Swing and see if that helps. It also, if you, if you don't have enough rotation, make sure you're not too bent over here like this and you add some extension in here like this. Also make sure you rotate your lower body enough, right? I have to see a little bit more to answer that good. Any drills or thoughts on stop topping the ball um, with the irons? Yeah, I'd have to see why it's happening. So no, not really. Uh, Dave, what's the relationship between shafting about address up or down and takeaway backswing on downswing? What's the relationship between shaft angle at address up or down and takeaway backswing or downswing? What effect is really like that? So the higher the handle at address, the more unhinged you are, the more low and inside the club goes. The lower the handle at address, the more you have hinge, the more up and out the handle goes. But if the club and belt line is stock, the lower you go, the easier it is to hinge up and out like Ryan Moore. The higher you go, the club goes low and inside like Bryson DeChambeau. Do you have a proper system to count your punting distance? No, I would do it by feel. You showed a yellow swing guide attached from your last video. I have one and use it with low irons, but one to know, do you find that one should position it the same higher or lower with longer clubs? Um, I, the swing guide, I have to play around with it. I think the lower you put it on the, on the shaft, um, the more it allows you to hinge. The higher you put it on the shaft, the less it allows you to hinge. Um, so you got to play around with that one. Struggle to close the club face. Could my grip or backswing or both? Could be, yeah, I'd have to see, Rob. Could be grip, could be forearm rotation, could be wrist conditions, could be face at address. I'd have to see. Is it worth getting fit if you're a 10 handicap? Absolutely. If money's not an object, absolutely. If it is, um, probably still absolutely. John, my coach has me working on lead arm depth. He's a smart guy, that coach. It seems like it kicks my path even more to the right. What kind of feels will help me add, maintain depth with more neutral swing direction? For you, John, it's all about creating depth and keeping depth without the trail shoulder going this way. Because if I get my trail shoulder back in front of me versus here, that's also going to change where my club shaft is in space and you being able to turn with it. Keep, you got to focus on that right arm, my friend. That's the answer for you. Dave, how come I'm hitting irons and hybrids great, but driver is absolutely horrible? Absolutely. I, I got bad news for you. I have absolutely no idea. I'd have to see. George, great answer. Thank you. Uh, Simon, do you intentionally change risk conditions on the way down or does it happen naturally? For me, it happens naturally. If you do it well, it should happen naturally. If not, you need to consciously change it. Uh, catch you next week. We'll see you then. We'll see you then. George, when will we see the secret photographer? Whenever she wants to come out in front. Um, any drills to make the right foot stay down longer and not have it come up on the toes and knee collapse toward the ball? Yes, we're going to do a video on that. Best way to practice opening the hips at impact. Search my name and rotation. We also have a rotation master class and an early extension master class that goes through all that. Eric, what do you think of the two iron the tailor made? Um, I have never used it, so I don't know. Do you other people ever get? No, okay. Uh, no. Thank you for all your tea. You're welcome. Thank you're welcome. You're welcome. Welcome. Lazy long time difficult for me to start a YouTube channel. I did it and now the channel has existed for several months, but it's not acting up. I ask you to help me. Yeah, we didn't really get hits on ours either for a year. So you're early yet, my friend. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope you guys had fun. Sorry for the rapid at the end. I took a little too long earlier, um, but hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. If you guys, uh, whoever was at the end there that went rapid, if you ask me again next week earlier, um, I'll give you a better answer to that. If I mentioned about your swing videos, check out golf.com. That is where you can post your videos. If I see your swing, I can help you a lot more. If you don't like it, you can cancel whenever you want, um, but at least check that out so I can help you guys. I think that's it. Check out that putting mirror from Sean Webb. Um, and um, yeah, if you guys have any recommendations for people you'd like us to see, uh, who you'd like to see us do videos with, we're going to be doing a bunch more collaborations over the next couple of months. Um, people like to see topics, stuff like that. So hope all is well. We'll do this again next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you guys have a good week and uh, we'll see you then.